And again, this is a very important, very interesting uh, material and uh, very fundamental. That's called it's called fundamental matrix. So every field has um, uh, fundamental matrix. So computer vision fundamental matrix. You are going to learn now. And um, so this is in a bigger context of the transformation between two images. So we have talked about in great detail. You know, transformation can be just translation. One image is translated from compared to other image. It can be rotation. It can be rigid, which contains both the rotation and translation. It can be similarity transformation, which compared the scale and the rotation, and affine, which has six parameters, uh, projective, which has eight parameters, and pseudo perspective, which is approximation of the projective, and then we have bilinear and so on. So the whole series of transformation we have run, run through, and you know how we achieve them, and then we have used them to align images and so on. Okay. So now this is in that context. So we're going to talk about fundamental matrix. It's a little different, but it's very interesting, very important um, part of computer vision. So once we know how to compute fundamental matrix between two images, then we can use this for stereo. We can use for structure for motion. We can use for view and mirror interaction recognition and many, many applications. So here's application of stereo. So we have two images. And um, in order to find the depth disparity, identify these images so that we can just take a pixel from this row and go to the same row and find this image. And this will become the depth map. And you need to do that using fundamental matrix. So this is the problem that you can take images from any different uh, orientation, but you want to flatten them like this so that you can you know, go from one row to the exactly same row and find its match. Um, also, um, the um, you listened to this one before. Uh, I will not turn on the thing. So somehow this, when I just enter, it works and then it doesn't work. Anyway, so, so you have listened to this PhotoSynth uh, video from Microsoft, uh, <coughs> which, <coughs> which shows you that um, um, would we'll show you that you can compute that, that you know taking this cloud of pines you can compute reconstruct 3D and so on. Um, so fundamental matrix um, started it was introduced by Longient Higgins is a British uh, researcher 1981. And he actually introduced as an essential matrix, and we are going to talk about that. And he had a paper in Nature, which is a very prestigious, you know, journal, as you know. Uh, then, 1992, simultaneously, Richard Hartley and um, Fogeras, Olvia Fogeras, they came up with the fundamental matrix. So, essential matrix is basically relating uh, the um, 3D coordinates and um, of two images, and the fundamental matrix relating the image coordinates of those 3D points. So that's why it's called fundamental matrix. And um, we're going to talk about um, Zhang Yu Zheng's um, efficient method to compute the robust method to compute the fundamental matrix. And um, uh, we will also talk about Hartley's method, eight-point algorithm, to compute the uh, fundamental matrix. So first we apply this and we'll apply this. And um, so Zheng Yu Zheng was a PhD student under Fogras. So all these you know guys are somehow related. Um, so the fundamental matrix is so important that um, there is actually a song on that. So I will play for you to just motivate motivate you to, you know, there's a lot of fun in science also. Um, and this is a link for that and you can you can watch the rest of the one.
So maybe the network is slow or something. Um, or do they bend to see the videos and the UCF network? We just wait a little bit. It doesn't seem to be loading. No? Maybe it's stuff at home. Maybe it's WhatsApp. Maybe refresh. It's loading, isn't it? Yeah, maybe refresh. But I play this at home. Okay. Good. So where is the sound? It's playing now? So that's a book by Zissamen and Andrew Zissamen and Hartley. It's a very famous book. The fundamental matrix is the stereogeometry. A matrix with nine entries It's square with size 3 by 3 Has 7 degrees of freedom It has a rank efficiency It's only of rank 2 Call a matrix F and you'll see Two points that correspond Column vectors called X and X prime X prime transpose times F times X equals zero every time the bipolar constraint involves a bipolar light Those multiplying F by X results in vector L prime is the F bipolar light The other being passing through X prime Spaces of F are the epipoles, E prime and B. All of the epipolar lines could pass through these. These are linear estimation example, take the set, make points out, which could start to make it, take the SPD, and the elements of F in the last column of B. Yeah, shift points. If you try to estimate the critical kind of set of points, your sample set will be degenerate. So that's nice. Huh? Okay. How did you find that? <laughs> I try very hard to to entertain you guys. <laughs> okay. So, so let's now, you know, get serious to, to talk about, you know, what this fundamental matrix is. And we will first talk about some background preliminaries so that you feel more comfortable because always here people say, well, I don't know this math and I don't know this. So let's cover this. So what, uh, we are going to talk about the concept, what is called linear independence. And we'll talk about rank of a matrix. As you heard, they were talking about rank in that song and matrix norm, singular value decomposition, and vector cross product, which can be expected in matrix multiplication. And other th 
thing is called RainSec, which is the um, random sampling and consensus. Again, I have a song for this, so I'll, <laughs> I'll play for that. And that's also a very, very important uh, technique which is used in many, many different things. Uh, and you know, you should understand that. Okay, so linearly independence. Okay, so this is a very fundamental concepts. And so we have a set of vectors. Um, these are shown here, n vectors. We will say that these vectors are linearly dependent. Then if we can write down like this as a linear combination of these n vectors and uh, this becomes zero such that not all the elements are zero. If the all elements are zero, zero, that's fine. But if all elements are zero, uh, not zero, then these are called linearly dependent. They depend on each other, which means if it is zero, then we can take one of the element which is not zero and express that in terms of other rest of the n minus one elements. So the vectors which cannot be written like this, or if they can be written like this, then not all are zero. They are called linearly independent. If all, not all of them are zero, then they are called linearly dependent. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea that these are the unique vectors so that I cannot express another vector. Um, I can express another vector in terms of those two vectors. Like, like when you have two dimension, you have x axis, y axis. So x axis says 1, 0, y axis 0, 1. Now I can represent any vector as a linear combination of those two linearly independent vectors. And they can be you know, like this and like that. Again, they are linearly independent. But if I take the vectors uh, such that, you know, which uh, uh, cannot uh, be written like this, then we will have one of the vector will be linearly dependent. And we want to find out what are the maximum number of vectors which are linearly dependent. And that is important concept. So uh, another thing is the rank of a matrix. So matrix, as you know, has a columns and rows. And um, then we are saying it matrix will have a column rank and the row rank. And um, this is valid also for the rectangular matrix, which is nothing else the square matrix. So column rank of a matrix is the maximum number of linearly independent column vectors. You know, so if you have matrix, you have many columns, now some columns may be linear dependent on other ones, but there can be very few columns which are linearly independent, that none of those can be written as a combination of the other ones. But when it's a linearly dependent, then at, you know, some of them can be represented linear combination of remaining one. So that's the idea. And the row rank is, again, that we take the rows, uh, how many rows we have which are linearly independent that will come low, uh, row rank of the matrix. And um, now, once we know the rank, so that will give us a dimension of that matrix, the, that maximum dimension we need is this much to represent all the vectors in that space. So we have a column rank and we have a row rank and so on. So let's look at a simple matrix. This is the three by three matrix. And this has three rows and three columns. So maximum it can have three linearly independent vectors, linearly independent columns or linearly independent rows. But let's find out how many are there. So one way to show that to convert this into upper triangular matrix, which means on the diagonal, below the diagonal, we want to make all zero, and above the diagonal will be non-zero. So we want to make this element zero. What we're going to do, multiply this two, and we add up to become zero. So that is operation is called here, that we multiply two with first row and add with second row, and that will become zero, one, three, because two minus two is zero, and four minus three is 1, and two, 2 plus 1 is 3. And then we want to make this also 0, so that we can do the same thing, multiply uh, the upper one by 3, and add, subtract that from the third row. And that will give us, this will become 0. We've got 3 minus 3 is 0, and 6 um, 
um, <coughs> minus 5 is, you know, 5 minus 6 is minus 1, and similarly, this will become 0 minus 3 is minus 3. So now we have, in this column, we have all 0. And in this column, below the diagonal, we'll make this 0 also. So we'll multiply again with um, the row, which is shown here, the R2. We can just add them. We can add this and this. This will become 0, and this will become 0. And this is what we have. So now all the elements below the diagonal, first column, 0. All the elements below the diagonal, second column, 0 and third column zero. So this is called upper triangular matrix. It has non-zero element in the upper triangular, zero element on below. lower triangular, it's called also a row echelon form. So now as you see that this has actually two rows which are linearly independent because this is zero, zero rows, you know, zero columns. So it's not, you know, it can be always written like that. So that is uh, one notion of the rank of this matrix, so the rank is two, okay? Instead of, even though it's a three by three matrix. So that's what we have. Now, s next concept is called singular value decomposition, which is called SVD. It's also very useful. And there's a whole theorem which is saying that if you take M by N matrix A, um, for which say M is greater than or equal to N, we can write that matrix in terms of these three matrices. Okay, O1, sigma, O2, and um, this is the factorization of this matrix into three matrices. It's called singular value decomposition also. Okay, so this is M by N, and this O1 will become M by N, this uh, sigma will become N by N, and then O2 will become N by N. So if you multiply this, we'll get you M by N, and multiply with this again, again N by N. So, uh, so this sigma is diagonal matrix, which will have the singular value. Diagonal matrix means only the diagonal elements are non-zero, other elements are zero, okay? And um, so these matrices are orthogonal, okay? So we talk about orthogonal matrices in the uh, rotation matrices. Uh, okay, so which means that their property that we can find the inverse of the matrix is finite transpose of that to become inverse for the O1 and O2. So then we talk about a norm of a matrix. A norm is like a absolute value. If you take a take a element, take a vector, you can find a magnitude of that. And magnitude is, you know, if vector is two dimensional, say x and y, so x square plus y square under root, that's called Euclidean norm. Or you can take um, absolute value and them up, which is you know L1 norm and so on. So therefore, similarly we have the matrix because matrix has different elements. It's not just vector, but there are many rows. So the the L1 norm is obtained by taking the value of um, particular you know. Um, <clears throat> particular element in a column and we take the absolute value, sum them up, and we get the one value for a column. Then we take the next column, then we will get the value in next column and so on. So here as you see, we're looking at different columns. Columns is the second index here. First index is row. So we get different each one value which is sum of absolute value of all the elements in that particular column and then we pick the maximum of that, that's called L1 norm of this matrix. And there's an L infinity norm, which is that you are taking the maximum or the sum, you know. So here, we are going through different um, rows, uh, different, um, the, here we are changing the column and going through the different rows, and then edit up is called L infinity norm. So um, these, norm, these notions will be uh, useful because you know, once you feel comfortable what we're talking about, then we can understand this whole thing. The last thing in this is what is called the vector cross product that can be expressed in the matrix multiplication. So you know two vectors, A and B, how to find a cross product of that. You've learned this in physics. So the way to do it is you took i, j, k, 
and this is the first vector, this is the second vector, and find the determinant of that. Yeah? So you see, you know, you take this one, this one, multiply with this, subtract this, this is the first element, minus, then take this one, take one, multiply this, and subtract that, and this one, and then this one, multiply this with this, and you get this one. This is the cross product of two vectors, which is very simple. Now the question is that we can do the cross product using the matrix multiplication. So we have this um, um, vector, the B vector. From the A vector, we will find this anti-symmetric matrix. Okay? So anti-symmetric matrix is that you look at a diagonal, then these elements are negative. This is negative of this, this is negative of this, this is negative of this. If this was positive, then it's called symmetric. You know, on the diagonal elements are the same. But now they are just different signs, and that's called anti-symmetric matrix. So we take the vector A, make a matrix like this, 3 by 3 matrix like that, anti-symmetric matrix. Now we multiply with this vector B, then we are going to get from here 0, then minus BYAZ plus BZAY which is this term. From here we'll get BX, AZ, and this will become zero, and then um, the BY will become zero, and this will become minus BZ, AX, which is this one. Then this multiply by this will be BX, AY, with minus sign, and BY, AX, plus sign, which is this one. So this is exactly the same as this. So we're saying that you can express the cross product with the matrix multiplication and matrix is obtained anti-symmetric from the first vector. So we're going to use that. Okay? So next thing we are going to talk about, and we have discussed this a little bit, but we can again review that. And I have a song for you for this also. And uh, so let's say we want to do least square fit. So, so we have a bunch of points and we want to find the line, baseline going through that. Uh, and we have talked about least square fit, which is the over constraint. You know, that we have more equation always, and less unknowns. As we did Lucas Canade, we did you know uh, a fine transformation and all this thing. That is least square fit. And when we want to fit a straight line, we'll have many points. Straight line has two unknowns. You no, know? but we can get a hundred points, and we want to fit the line. So each uh, uh, point will give you the one equation, so we have 100 equations and we have two unknowns. So it's called over constraint system. We have more constraints than the unknowns and we always use least square for that. The second thing which is RANSEC, um, which is called random sampling and consensus. So let's say you have 100 points. Now to find the parameter of a line, you just need two points, but you don't know which two points. It's because in those 100 points, there may be lots of outliers, some wrong points, and you will, you will have problem. So what you do, you randomly select or sample two points from 100 points and fit a line. And then find the error of that line from other points and note down that. Then you randomly select another two points, fit a line, find the error, note down. And you keep doing that, so you'll have many possible lines. You will pick the line which gives you the least error. Basically, that's called RENSEC. And it's very intuitive and very simple and works very powerful. So we can talk about that. Um, then there's another uh, interesting thing, which is called under constraints, it's called Huff transform. So Huff transform actually will take fewer constraints than required and find all possible solution and then do the voting. So we have these three like um, levels, you know, it's under constraint, constraint, equal number of constraint, what you, what you are unknown, and this over constraint. So all these three uh, are very important methods which we will be using in computer vision. We already talked about a lot about this. We're going to talk about this today, and this we'll talk. There's a whole lecture on half transform. We'll talk about that. Okay. So, so this is the uh, problem that we have set up points. So, let's say we have five points. 
we want to fit a line to that and the equation of line is y is equal to mx plus c. Fitting a line means we want to find m and c, the slope and intercepts. Okay, so which means that um, standard linear f r that we want to, um, if we know that which points belongs to uh, to the line, if there's only one line, then it's easy. Then we can just you know uh, do the least square fit um, if there's only one line. And this is the equation of a line. And we will basically find M and C uh, such that this error is minimized, which is the take the error, square the error, minimize that. That's called, it's called least square fit. OK? Uh, and as we have been doing, we will find derivative of this with respect to M, derivative of this with respect to C, equal to 0, and all the things we have done many, many times. So which is shown here. So another way to do is using pseudo inverse, but they will end up with the same solution. That we have each point, we get one equation, we get a bunch of equations, n points, n equations. We put them in this matrix form. That if I take this one, multiply with first row, I'll get first equation, take this and multiply with second row, and all this. this is a different way to write these equations. Then this matrix cannot be inverted, so we'll multiply with the transpose, and then the whole thing will be common and this will become D. So that's, you know, that's what we have been doing many, many times. So you should know that. And this kind of question will be on the exam. So you should be prepared. OK, so now let's talk about what is RENSEC and why is it good. And, um, you know, so RENSEC, as I said, it's called Random Sampling and Consensus. And uh, let's go to the song first. say notion of inlier and outlier. So simply inliers are the points which lie on the line. 
outliers are the which don't lie on the line, which can be due to noise and so on. So a priori we don't know which are inlier, which are outlier, and that's the way we are going to pick these randomly and look at these uh, lines. Okay, so let's you know this is the um, algorithm. It's very simple, two steps: randomly select two points to fit a line, find the error between the estimate solution um, to all other points. If the error is less than tolerance, then quit. Else, go to step one. You just keep going that, and you will be done. So now we are going to use these concepts: the Rensake, the rank concepts, uh, linearly independent, SVD, and all those things to talk about how we can compute the fundamental matrix between two images. Given two images, we want to compute the matrix which relate these two images. Um, so. We are going to also talk about what is called epipolar geometry, as you heard in the song, the first one. So let's say we have a 3D world, you know, like this room here, and uh, we take two pictures. One is from left camera, another one from the right camera. So left camera will give you this image plane, and uh, then right camera will give you another image plane. Okay. So now, as you know, that you know. The, if there's a point in 3D here, its image will be formed here. This is the image plane, and this is a lens of a camera center. And let's say its picture is XL. And of course, the, all the points which lie on this line will have the same image. Yeah. And similarly, the image of this point, same point in this, will be this one, but the other points will have a these different images because you are looking at different side. Okay, so now we are going to assume that these cameras are separated by T translation vector, and so these points which form a line, which is the projection of actually one point, which is the image of this point, this uh, 3D point, and all the points here, it's called epipolar line. Okay, this is called epipolar line. So what is happening that point in left image maps to a line in the second image because all the points here are mapped to one point, but when you look at from different side, then all these points are matched to different points and you get line. Okay? So that's one important notion you need to understand a people line. And the image of the lens center, suppose image of this where the lens is. In the from the right to the left, this is the image of the right camera in the left is called epipole. And this epipole in a way is also the intersection of image this epipole for the left camera and this is the epipole of the right camera. As you see, this is the image of this lens here. Now these um, two epipole EL and ER they actually intersect the image plane here. So this um, line will intersect here and here. So these are the epipole. And then um, the next thing is called epipolar plane. So this is a plane which is formed from this point to this um, camera center and this camera center. This whole plane is called epipolar plane. So these are the important concepts. Yes? Um, just from the image, it's not very clear. So when I go from the camera to the epipole, for example, to the right, it looks like I can keep going with that line and eventually intersect with epipole left. Yeah. But that does not that's not necessarily the case, right? Depending on how I have my camera set and what yeah. the focal. Yeah, I mean, camera is here. So I've set a camera here. This is a center. So I'm drawing the straight line from here to here. So I'm making sure that so, the cameras are set up. No, no. I mean, see, the idea is that this is your right camera, yes? And this is my lens. And let's say it's a pinhole, just a one point. So whenever I take a picture, as you know, I take a straight line from that point to draw the straight line from the lens. That's the way light travels. So I draw a line, straight line from here 
connect with this one and wherever this intersect the image plane that's its image same way if I take this thing I draw a straight line from here to here and it intersect here so this is the image of uh, this point which is visible in the right camera so it's just a straight line okay so so those are the notions the epipole epipolar line and epipolar plane and it's a pretty simple idea um, but we are going to use this heavily um, so we have two cameras left camera right camera camera is represented by a lens center which is cl in left cr in right and the point p in 3d is there they're taking his pictures these these are separated by t it's a kind of baseline or distance or translation between them and uh, that's it so we just connect the point p to the both lens you know cameras or lenses here that the other camera is just a lens it's a point then draw a line here draw a line here draw a line here that's a plane it's called like people line it. then we are saying that if i take a point in left image it is projected to the line in the right image because these are the points which are parallel to this point all these map to single point but when i look at from here these are actually different points in this image so a point here maps to a line here okay so that's called epipolar line then the epipoles are the images of the camera lens of the left and the right and vice versa and the the line connecting the epipoles intersect these image planes which is shown here and the separation between them is translation so that's the idea okay so once we know that then we can go in deeper here and so we will we'll talk about we'll say this vector is pl this vector is pr and this vector is t and um, then since these vectors lie in a plane so they are coplanar so we will use this coplanar constraint that if we can take two vectors in a plane and find its um, cross product two vectors in a plane find a cross product the cross product will always be perpendicular to that plane you know you learn this in physics so that vector if you find dot product of that vector with any vector in the plane will be zero because it's perpendicular this is you know they are at 90 degree angle so cosine of 90 is zero so that's called coplanarity constraint and we are going to start with that so we have uh, these vectors you know t vector pl vector and pl minus t vector uh, these vectors are in the same plane in epipolar plane so therefore we can take a vector t and p find the cross product and find a dot product with third vector pl minus t this has to be zero because they're in the same plane okay so also we can relate the pr uh, which is um, this vector in terms of this uh, pl with respect to this coordinate system because we have the translation between this and this is t so we take a pl translate it t and this possible rotation ro apply rotation to that so we can go from pl to pr like this which is simple rigid transformation as we've been talking about so now we have these two things one is these lie in a plane and other is that we can relate the pl with pr in terms of rotation matrix and also the translation okay so from here we can simplify this and uh, we can find the um, the you know bring this on this side r transpose and then we have pl minus t and then we find the transpose of both sides so this will become transpose but transpose of this will become pr transpose and r because when you have two two matrices a b transpose of that is b transpose a transpose you know they will change the order and you can verify that so now we got this thing pl minus t transpose is given by pr transpose r which we can use here to simplify further so we have a pr transpose r instead of this we get it from here because this is equal to that 
then we have a T and cross product of PL. Okay, so we have so far we are here. Two things: the covalent constraint, constraint, and then the simple rigid transformation between two of these coordinate system. Then we are going to um, go through this and um, express this cross product between T and PL in terms of matrix. That's what we we did that before. So we have PR transpose or T cross PL. We will say it is S multiplied by PL. S is the anti-symmetric matrix obtained from T vector and PL is the same thing. And this anti-symmetric diagonal and these are the negative of each other. This is the T vector which is here. So now we have this PR which is the 3D location of a point in, from right camera. PL which is 3D location of the same point from the left camera. R is a rotation between these two coordinate system. S represent the translation between these two coordinate system. Okay. So now we have two matrices, the rotation matrix and S matrix, which is actually anti-symmetric matrix made out of the translation vector. And the product of these two matrices is called E matrix, which is essential matrix. So you have fundamental, then you have essential. Essential, then you go to fundamental, which is much more important. So it's you know product of two matrices is E matrix, essential matrix. So that's up to here what is the Lingen, uh, Langen Hegen came up with this. So this has to be zero, which means what is saying, if I take a point with respect to left coordinate and take a point with respect to right coordinate, then if I know this R matrix, then multiply these, then it has to be zero according to this geometry. It's very simple. We, we just drive it. Okay? So that essential matrix is a product of R rotation matrix and S matrix which is the uh, made out of the translation vector. Okay, so now we will actually go further from essential matrix, we are going to get the fundamental matrix, which is going to relate the, the points in image, in the left image with the point in the right image. Right now, essential matrix is relating the 3D coordinates. Here we are going to relate the 2D coordinates, okay? So now what we do is that when we have a point in 3D, we apply this camera matrix. We talk about M matrix, you know, which contains all those things. So we get this image here in the, in the left camera, and we apply the camera matrix for right camera, which we get image here, XR, which are shown here. And so we have this relationship of the essential matrix, which these are the 3D coordinates here, the right and left. So we're going to use this to come up with uh, better representation so that we don't have to deal with the uh, 3D coordinates. So from here, PL, we can f take the inverse of this, bring in on this side. So PL can be written inverse camera matrix minus XL. Similar PR can be written inverse camera matrix XR. And um, so this can also be written as uh, when we take the transpose of this, then this can be written XR transpose and MR minus T. So we can do that. So now we are going to simplify because the um, PR transpose from here is XR transpose and MR minus T, which we put here. And PL from here is ML minus inverse XL, which is here. So right now what we have, these are the image coordinate right, image coordinate on the left of the same point, essential matrix, and these are the camera matrices. Okay? Now the all these are three by three matrices. Remember this was three by three because in the translation and rotation matrix and these are camera matrix also three by three. So we multiply them and we can just come up with one matrix called F, which is a fundamental matrix. And what we have now is we can take the point in left image, take the corresponding point in right image, then if you know the fundamental matrix, then this has to be zero. And that's a very important result. You know? That is the fundamental matrix between two images.
and we just drive its geometry. Okay? So, and you can say that the fundamental matrix is essentially essential matrix multiplied by these camera matrices. Okay? And uh, what this is saying, even though this transformation is 3D, but we have multiplied all these matrices, we come up with one matrix, and it's relating points in image left to the image right. And we don't need to know all the 3D rotation translation camera matrix. It's again image based, which is very nice. As we did for the affine, the um, projective and so on, the only difference here is that here we don't have that we take a point in XL, multiply by a fundamental, we get one point. We take one point, we'll get a line. So this relationship is different, that we take the point and cross one point, find the product, it has to be zero. So it's a little different because of this one point mapping to many points in the other image. Okay, so that is your fundamental matrix and, and you know you should be able to drive this because it's pretty intuitive, pretty simple to be able to do that. So now uh, it's a three by three matrix and um, these are the elements as you saw I think in the song they were talking about this. And um, so given a point in left image, a people line right camera, we can find out using a few other fundamental matrix. And um, it is a three by three matrix with nine components, but uh, rank of uh, this matrix is two because this is a product of the essential matrix and camera matrices. Now, essential matrix is a product of rotation matrix, which is rank three, and the translation matrix with anti symmetric matrix, and it has rank two. So, therefore, if you take two matrices, multiply together, the rank of the product will be the lower rank of one of the matrices. So that's why it is rank two, okay? So now other thing is that it has the seven degrees of freedom even though we have nine unknowns. So one is this is the like um, uh, homogeneous system because it's equal to zero. So one vec you know, degree of freedom we can get rid of like that. The other is that the um, determinant of this is zero also, this uh, fundamental matrix, which we'll, we'll discuss. So due to that, we get two less degrees of freedom, so therefore we have seven degrees of freedom. And in a way, it captures that we have 3D rotation, three degrees of freedom, 3D translation, we have three degrees of freedom in scale. So it's capturing the seven degrees of freedom between two images. Um, so, so that's fine. So this is the history as I told you that Longent Higgins came up with essential matrix in 81, 92, Hartley and Fogdra simultaneously published papers in different conferences about the fundamental matrix and Zheng Zhu Zheng who is right now in Microsoft um, came up with the uh, robust estimation of fundamental matrix. Okay. So, um, so fundamental matrix captures the relation between corresponding points and two views. And um, so we are going to talk about how to compute, given two images, how to compute fundamental matrix, okay? We have drive it now and we want to know how we can compute. And the way we are going to compute is that we will get image left, image right, and we'll find the points, shift points, for example, shift points here, and find the corresponding points. So this point corresponds to this one, this point corresponds to that one. And those points have to satisfy this fundamental matrix constraint that point here multiply by F and point there had to be zero. That's what the fundamental matrix is. So we're going to use this property to compute the F. So suppose we look at the point I in the left image, corresponding point right image, so multiply with fundamental matrix, it has to be zero. Okay? So we are going to look at several points like that. Um, so the when we multiply this one first, so as you see that this one will come xi prime f11 
yi prime f12 and f13 which is this one multiply with this will become xi prime f21 yi prime f22 and plus f23 and so on then multiply this again with that so um, <coughs> this will be multiplied by xi yi and so on so we'll get like that so it's one equation now in this one equation we have 12 unknowns which are shown here and the other ones are known because xi and yi and xi prime yi prime are known because we know the points and corresponding point so like that we will get this uh, again the linear system um, we'll get like this one corresponding will give one equation we will get lots of equations like that um, and f is unknown so we can write down like that again the um, since it's a homogeneous system we are going to select one of this element as one and um, then we have to find out these the uh, <coughs> remaining and so we have this f vector and then these are the first point second point third point end point and this is the called measurement matrix so linear system so m is nine by nine rows and in in um, columns um, so rank is must be eight because homogeneous system it has to be at least one place um, so so let's talk about this Hartley's eight point algorithm um, which is pretty standard and that says that you need eight point correspondences to compute fundamental matrix you know, because in term nine they are eight, you know the uh, <coughs> Okay, so uh, compute the fundamental matrix F such that this is satisfied. That that's what we want to do because that's our case. Point from the right image, corresponding point from left image, and find the product of this with F should be zero. So now we have to deal with these you know practical issues because we are given these coordinates of the points which you get from shift points, and these points have to be normalized and uh, that will um, uh, make everything you know uniform and we will not have problem otherwise image size can be different some can be 256 by 256 some can be you know bigger and there will be a problem so what we will do that we will normalize the images um, by applying some transformation t and we'll call these transform coordinates head so xi will map to xi head and then we can map this back and uh, so that transformation will normalize these coordinates between 0 and 1 so we'll have some scale and then also move the origin uh, with the translation so we will make the centroid of the m point all the points as the origin and we will normalize these x and y coordinates between 0 and 1 so that is the first step which we'll do in at point algorithm. Now, um, then the um, the way we are going to solve this is that that A matrix we talk about here, which is um, or this matrix where we put all these points. Um, since the the rank of this is the eight even though there are nine unknowns we will find the the eigenvector corresponding the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix so you already know that given a matrix you can find eigenvalues we did this uh, in the Harris and other there was homework problem and so on so here that was two by two but here is a bigger matrix but that's fine we can find out the eigen vectors of this and we will look at the eigen vector which corresponds smallest eigen value 
and that actually will be the solution for the linear system and that we can determine and um, from there once we know the solution that eigenvector we can make as a matrix because here remember we have done here make this as a vector but even though these are our vector elements you know here we have done here so this is our matrix and we make the vector but this was the actually matrix so once we get that vector we make it a matrix like this and this is kind of the first estimation of the fundamental matrix using this idea given two images given the points given the question points we put those things in that matrix here this thing and uh, before that we normalize them between 0 and 1 and put a center at the origin uh, which is centroid of these points then we take a matrix and find the smallest eigen vector correspondence smallest eigen value and that's a solution so then this is the first step we get this fundamental matrix then we want to normalize it and uh, which means that we divide by the norm of this matrix and we talk about how to find the norm just you know divide each element by that which is easy and we can use the L1 norm which is um, defined like that so we get that and um, then now this is uh, any 3 by 3 matrix because we haven't imposed this constraint that is a rank deficient matrix because remember that the translation matrix is the anti-symmetric matrix and the rank deficient and translation matrix was in the E matrix and it is also an F matrix because we multiply all those so we want to do that and how we are going to do it we'll take this F matrix and uh, we'll find the SVD we'll factorize this in three matrices U matrix the diagonal matrix and the V matrix so these diagonal elements are the singular value or the inverse of eigenvalues so we will force it that the third element here will be zero and that will make this L matrix as a rank deficient it will decrease its rank and that's the what we want because fundamental matrix is not any 3 by 3 matrix which we get from that solution but we want to make sure it is the rank deficient so we'll artificially make that third element zero and then multiply the u and v prime with that and that will be a better uh, matrix and then we will denormalize because remember that we converted these coordinates between applying the t transformation so between 0 and 1 and we put a center at origin at the center of the points so we are going to go back and uh, we'll apply these T matrix to go back to F and that's that's the the fundamental matrix 8 point algorithm for fundamental matrix by Hartley is a paper in PEMI and um, it is um, pretty important paper so what we have discussed first is we discuss what is the fundamental matrix and how we drive it using simple geometry and I think that's not hard and you should be able to you know drive it and main idea was the planar epipolar plane two vec three vectors lying in the same plane if you take two vectors find a cross product dot product by other vector that is zero so that's the starting point then other thing is that I can relate the coordinates with respect to left camera to the right coordinate system by rotation translation and these two cameras are separated by T so go through all this then we say that becomes essential matrix then we say we take a picture and then we define the camera matrices left MR ML and go through that and come up with F which is the product of all these matrices so that is the relationship that taking a point in the f left image multiply with F take the corresponding point right it has to be zero
that's called fundamental matrix, which you should remember. Then given that, then we say, well, now, given two images, how we can compute fundamental matrix, that's so useful. And the process is, well, let's look at the definition of fundamental matrix. Say x transpose f, x is equal to zero. So we use that thing. Now, if we know the correspondence of one point, give you one equation, you know the end points in the equations, we put those things with the kind of least square fit, and we have that, you know, uh, the eight unknowns, so we, it's eight points, and then we find the eigenvector corresponding the smallest eigenvalue, and that's what we did, but then we have little other housekeeping to make sure that these coordinates are normalized so that we don't end up doing different things for different sizes of images. So we normalize these coordinates between zero and one, and we put the origin in the center of the uh, points centroid of the points and also we made sure that this matrix is rank deficient. So we did the SVD and artificially made the third eigenvalue zero and then multiply again and then we did the renormalization applying this transformation T, T transpose and we are done. So that's uh, for today. So now after that, then uh, there was a nice paper by Zheng Yu Zheng to improve that estimation of the fundamental matrix. And he came up with what is called robust um, um, fundamental matrix estimation. So uh, as you can realize that you know, in the image, can, there can be lots of points. You know. Now the question is which eight points you want to select using the Hartley's algorithm. It's difficult. So what uh, Zheng Yu Zheng did, say, well, let's take an image like this and divide in eight by eight cells, okay? Which are shown here, a grid. Then um, what he will do, that randomly select uh, eight points um, corresponding from each of the grid points. So you will randomly select eight. There are 64 of those grid, point, grid cells now. So you select eight, and from each you select one point, so that you are selecting these points, you know, whole image, not arbitrarily select the upper half or lower half and so on. So that will be a problem. So you do that, and using those eight points, you compute fundamentals using the Hartley's algorithm, okay? And now you want to see that how good is that estimation of fundamental matrix. So then you want to look at the error that, as we said, that while you take a point in the second image and um, multiply by a fundamental matrix, you will get a line. And then the corresponding point in the first image should lie on the line. And ideally, you know, practically it won't. So there will be some distance. And that distance is D, P, 1K, F, P, 2K. That's a distance, that's an error. And you want to do the same thing. You want to take the point in the first image, apply fundamental matrix, go to the second image, and see how far it is from the line, and take that error. You add up that error. And that is the residual error, yes. Uh, those points that we're selecting where we just want to verify of, uh, mm -hmm. they are not the same that we used before, right, to calculate? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So what we are going to do is um, essentially you want to use all the points. See, because you only use eight points to find the, find the fundamental matrix. Now you want to say how good is that fundamental matrix. It has, to, it has to satisfy all the points which you found. So basically you do this for all the points. And including, of course it will, it will work for the eight points which you use because that's what we use to find the error. So the main thing is that you want to find the error of other points. So one way we just use other points as you're saying, or use all the, all the points. I think it's better to find, use the other points as you, as you thought. So yes. can you use pseudo-inverse? 
Yeah, so, so see the, the pseudo inverse will come in that instead of finding the eigenvector with the least eigenvalue as I told you here. So, you know, this thing, so this is a linear system, it's a right homogeneous system. And we've been talking about pseudo inverse and so on. So you can, you can do that. Uh, or just take this matrix and find the not, eigen. Not only the eight points, uh, if there are more points, uh, dozens of points, we can use this. Really yeah, so, so that's the thing. See, the, the main thing is that when you use pseudo inverse, you use all the points, then if there are some points which are outliers, the corresponds is wrong, so that will destroy the solution. So what uh, this method is doing, Zeng Yu Zeng, that it will be robust to those outliers. So you, at a time you select eight points. And if there are some outliers, wrong correspondences, then the error of that will be much more. And that way you will be able to identify those eight points you selected, some of those will be wrong, and you will look at the error which will be large and you can identify that. So, so the main difference, and it's a good question you're asking, so what we have learned so far, just use all the points, and more the better. But now the problem with that is that if there are few points which are outlier, which are wrong, but you don't know, that will destroy the whole thing. Why not use RENSEC? Huh? RENSEC. Yeah, so this is kind of RENSEC. That's, a, that's another good point, so you are getting there. So RENSEC is a way to deal with, so you randomly select two points. So this is in a way doing that. Yes, this, is, this is similar, okay? Good. So we are making progress. So this way it will find the error of every eight point selection you got. You get a fundamental matrix. You want to look at the error of remaining points. And this is symmetric error. The point here, go to the line, what's the error? Point here, go to the line, what's the error? Add it up. And uh, so from all those trials, you will pick the best F fundamental matrix, which has the, um, the uh, you know, smallest error. But the smallest error has to be, you know, um, <clears throat> the, um, some threshold. And uh, then using that, you will, uh, remove the outliers, you know, if the, if the, some fundamental metrics have very large error, then that will give you the outliers and you can get rid of those. And um, then now you have selected the, from these many, many different fundamental matrices, you select the best, which has the least error, this one, and then um, you have, using that, you have, because you know for each of the point, you know the error, because this is computed for each of the point. So you have lots of error for particular fundamental matrix, you select it, which has the least error. So using that, you remove the outliers, which has a larger error, and then remaining points you can use to do another fit to find the final fundamental matrix. And there, you can use the weighted least to square fit. You can assign the weight inversely proportional to the error which you found. So that those are the steps which you are about. Yeah. When I'm determining my outliers by checking if R sub k is greater than the threshold, mm -hmm. does that mean um, that I have to use the points that I have selected to create the fundamental matrix? No, 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 no. So see that this R, this is computed for the other points. So you have, you, you have computed some fundamental matrix, yes? Mm -hmm. Using that fundamental matrix, you compute the error of all remaining points. You have lots of errors of points. So then you, um, you know, add up all the errors for this fundamental matrix, this fundamental matrix, now, and the pick the one which has the least error. That's first step. Now you have that. That's a well, we are going to use that fundamental matrix. Now using that fundamental matrix, then you identify 
some point which has a very large error because you will get an error for each of the points. This RI is for each of the points, ith point. So, so you pick those and you remove those. Okay? So those are the outliers. And which means their correspondence was wrong. You know. So you remove those, you remaining one, you then use those to find the final one. So it's, it's very nice, very interesting. And that's a way to you know, deal with the outliers, and this is basically RENSEC. You know, this is randomly sampling and coming with a consensus. And so on here, we need eight. And if you remember, we did in straight line, we needed two. So we're selecting two, and, and that's the idea. OK? So that's that. And um, so let's then now finish this up. Um, so now the, um, we can use this fundamental matrix in these epipolar lines. So this is one image. This is the second image. They are taking of the same scene from different viewpoint. So if I look at uh, this point, correspond to this point, this is the epipolar line. So this point matches to the line. So as you were asking earlier, that when we find the match of the points, of course this point matches with this. That's what we are going to do using SIFT and so on. But now once we compute the fundamental matrix, then we know corresponding to this point, what is the epipolar line, which is this one. And match of this should lie on this line. Okay? So the similarly, match of this point you know, should lie on this line. So these are called epipolar lines, okay, as we showed you in the beginning of um, this thing. So, and this is another image, it's a drastically chain. Still we can compute the epipolar lines. So this is the point and this is corresponding to the epipolar line. So this is very nice. Uh, the more examples and so on. So these are your shift points and then you find the matches using shift descriptor and so on. So about this point, you will say, where does it match in this image? Of course, you are going to look at around the same neighborhood, same location, and say, well, this match is best with this one. So this is a match. So this is x, x i, y i. This is x i prime, y i prime. Similarly, you look at another one, find the match. Giving the match, get the fundamental matrix. Then getting fundamental matrix, you can find the people lines. Yes? Huh? There wasn't a correct What do you mean? This one? Oh, you were that. Yeah. OK. So what is this one? This is um, Empire State Building. Anybody going to New York? No. Oh, we should. OK. So let's, <laughs> let's do the, the stereo. So one application of this is in stereo, that you have two images. And um, you are looking at the point in 3D. And this is uh, first camera, this is second camera, left and right camera. And image of this point in the left camera will form here, image of this point will form here. And these cameras are separated by B, which is the best line. And the distance of this point in 3D is Z. And um, the, um, the, this distance from here to here, from image plane to the lens, is F, which is the focal length. So using these two triangles, there's one triangle here and smaller triangle here, we can find out a depth. And because the Z plus F upon Z, so there's a big triangle and then there's a small triangle, and then X1 plus B plus X2, which is for the big triangle, the base, and then smaller triangle B, they have to be equal, they are equivalent triangle. So using that, we can find out the Z is equal F, B, X1 plus X2. So X1 and X2 is called disparity, the distance from the left image compared to right image. B is called the baseline, the distance between cameras. F is a focal length. So it depends, the disparity depends on the depth, Depth depends on disparity in inversely proportional. If the disparity is large, depth is small. Disparity is, you know, uh, small, then the depth is large. So here's examples of stereo pair. These are two images, and using this kind of method, you can compute the depth, which is shown here. This is um, 
uh, pair and in computing depth, then you can visualize this from different viewpoint, which is shown here, and like that. So fundamental matrix is used to rectify these images. So image can be taken like this and taken like that. So you can rectify. Now you can just go to find the match of this. Um, you will just go in the same row in the next image, find that, and that will give you a disparity. And that can be used for stereo. So let's look at how we can find the match. So these are two images, and let's say they are rectified. Um, and we have one on the left, which is shown in the red box. We want to go to the right image, exactly same row. We want to find where does this match, OK? So, um, <clears throat> and we can look at different possibilities, you know, say, well, does it match here, does it match here, does it match here, and um, whichever give you the least error, our best match is the selection, and um, the, depending on how far you want to move this way or this way, disparity will change. And that's the plot here. So now to find the match of a page in left to the right, and we can do using correlation. And that's the first one of the first method for the stereo. So um, so now how do we do correlation? So we will take um, page in the left image, corresponding page in the right image. We'll do sum of square differences as we did before. Uh, in the optical flow and so on, and find the difference, square it, sum it up for all the pixels. It's a 2D window, and if it matches, you know, it has to be, it was exactly same, it will be zero, but if it matches, you know, small number. So this is one way of correlation, sum of square difference. You can, instead of squaring, you can look at absolute difference. Uh, you can multiply, this is a real correlation, multiplication as we talk about. Uh, you can normalize it, you know, do this correlation and then divide by this um, um, thing. And um, then there's another normalized correlation where you look at the mean and the standard deviation of a page here, page there. You have different measure to match a page from here to there. And um, so, so that is, you know, you can basically do a stereo like that. You know, take two images and assuming they are rectified, then you can just take a page and find the match and you can find disparity, you can find a depth map like that. So there are many, many stereo algorithms because in general it's not easy to find the match because there will be a lot of ambiguity. And so one of the <clears throat> earliest method uh, which was very popular is called Bernard's stereo method. So we're going to talk about it's a very simple idea. Um, and uh, so the idea is that um, we want to find the match so that a page in the left should have the brightness of the page in the left should have same brightness in the right. It's a brightness constraint, constraint which we use in optical flow also. But in addition to that, the disparity should be smooth over image. And so very similar, as you remember, an optical flow. We say brightness has to be similar, it has to be constant, and also the, the motion has to be smooth. So that's similar thing they use here. And this is expressed by this. So this is the, um, the brightness similarity. So we are looking at the left image, you know, different pixel. And uh, this is the right image with the disparity, because disparity will be shift in x direction. So that is the shift in x direction. And we want to find this. And so this is simple, your absolute difference, sum of square difference. And this is the you know, square window. So we have these, right now we are doing three by three window, but you can do any much. So that's the first constraint, similarity, similar intensity. Second constraint, we are saying the disparity map which we'll find has to be smooth, which means the gradient of that has to be small. Okay? So that is the lambda, the combined with that. 
So that's the function they use. And this is the definition of the disparity, which is finite derivative. This is a finite difference. Okay. So um, that's very simple. And uh, now, so that in a way is energy. This we want to minimize this energy E. We want to find the disparity D, which is a disparity map for every pixel. We want to come up with a number. Okay. And such that this is minimized in this definition. So now the question is how do we do it? Okay. Now one is we can do brute force source. We say, well, given these two images, the maximum disparity range is ten pixels. So we can, you know, look at so well, how about disparity one, how good is disparity two, how good is and so on. So then if we have hundred twenty eight by hundred twenty eight image and 10 possible disparity. So we will have lots of combination, which will be here, which is 10 to the power 16,000 you know, possible disparity. Which will be many, many combinations here to check what is disparity. So there will be a lot. So this is where we can use some intelligent way to minimize this energy or function. Uh, cost and Bernard used this what is called simulated alleling. So simulated alleling is a process in materials when they want to make good materials. They will heat up very high temperature then will lower down temperature slowly. When you heat up there will be lots of these molecules, atoms will you know have lots of movement and so on. So then when you slowly lower down then they'll become stable and you'll get very nice material. So that's what we are going to do here. And um, so we don't know for each pixel what is a disparity. So we just randomly se select a disparity. Okay? Um, and then we select a high temperature. So then we select another um, disparity randomly. So we'll compute the error, the energy between the first state, first disparity, and second state. Like, okay, what's the difference? Energy went down or energy went up? Both are random. No, so so we don't know. So we look at the difference. And if the energy went down, then we are going to take the next state, the S prime, which is the second state, which is a basically disparity. If it energy did not go down, so we are going to generate this P, which will be exponential minus delta E divided by temperature T. So depending on how much is the error, the delta E, and the temperature at the beginning, the temperature will be very high. We'll get some probability that with what probability we should take the state, even though it is in energy has gone up or not take it. So that's where randomness is coming up. So, um, so that what that will do is that if you have a, a function which is a local minima. Now, this is where I need a marker. Anybody has marker or do I have here picture? No, I don't have. Anybody has marker? Um, so, yeah. Okay. Very good. You don't have. You have. Okay, great. Thank you. Your whole pic. Come bring every day. Bring this one, please. <laughs> okay. So, so there is a function, okay? And um, this function is like this and like this. Let's make it like this, okay? This is a function, and what we want to find out, um, we want to find out the global minimum of this function, okay? So if you look at where is the global minimum of this? Where is the point where is the least? This is the point, yes? Here. Now, um, there are many local minimum. 
So suppose this is a minimum, this is a minimum, this is a minimum, this is a minimum. So one is a global minimum, which is this one, and these are the local minimum. So always whenever you want to minimize, there's a problem get caught in the local minimum and you want to get out of that. Now so what this is doing that wall <clears throat> will come up say well oh we took at this state the next state this one this is energy is lower we can just stop but this will be wrong because local minimum is here. So randomly we'll jump out we'll take the wrong step and we will go up, we will not, you know. So that will give you, you will end up with this thing. And these jumps we will do will depend, in the beginning we'll do lots of jumps because temperature is very high and then we slow down and we'll do less jumps. And that is called similar annealing. And so again, very, very simple intuitive method um, to, to do that, but that works, yes. Yeah, so temperature is this, this is the function here. So, so we will generate the, so we will, we will know what is the change in the energy, delta E. Yes, this is the delta E, and energy we have defined like this. As you remember that we have the, this is our energy, which is the difference between between left and right, the disparity, and the smoothness, which is the gradient. You understand energy, yes? If you know the disparity, you can compute energy. So we, we have one disparity, which is um, S, we have energy. We, can, we have another disparity, S prime, we have energy. We can find a difference, which is delta E, yes? That's energy difference. Now, depending on the delta E, we will generate this P, where delta E we know, we can put a number there, and T is a high temperature, high value. And we put in E to the power minus delta E upon T, we'll get some number, okay? So that is the temperature there, just uh, symbolically because this is using the simulator annealing, and we are doing this to find this number P, and what we are gonna do, that now we got a P, and we generate random number between zero and one. If P, if this random number X is less than P, then we will take that state. If it is not, we will not take it. So that's the algorithm. So temperature is here to compute the P. And we know the delta T, we have a started temperature and there's a whole, whole schedule that you start with 100, then every time you reduce by 10% and so on, there's all details, okay? So, uh, yes? The function of temperature can be, right? Huh? The function of temperature can be linear, exponential? No, function, I mean, yeah, I mean, how you change it? Yeah, yeah, how you change it. So there's a whole schedule that, see, you start with 100, then every time you reduce by 10% or something, that there's all, you know, those uh, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, conceptually, that's what's happening. That if the temperature is high, there's a lot of movement, then you'll take these wrong state quite, quite often. <laughs> but when the temperature is low, then you will take with less probability. So that's the idea. Okay? So we do that, and um, if no decrease in several iteration, lower temperature, and then you keep doing that. So that's, if you do that, then you can get the depth map like this about braid, toy, apple. And um, this is left to me, right to me, it's a depth map. And this is another depth map. And there is a whole data set uh, from Tsukuba University in Japan. Who has been to Japan? Nobody. Actually, I was there. You have been to Japan. I have been to Tsukuba. Where are you from? Which, which city in Tsukuba? You're not from Japan. Which city? Uh, Tokyo. Tokyo, okay. It's about one hour train drive from train to, from Tokyo to Tsukuba. I, I went there, it's very, very hot in summer. Okay, so, so this is the scene, 
and they have this ground truth for depth map as you see the lamp is you know a different distance than compared to this camera and so on so these are disparity the depths you know which is shown here so there are this finding the right depth map efficiently and quick you know correctly there's a whole area of research and uh, this is um, if you do the simple window based correlation this is the depth map you will get in the ground truth as you see you know the big difference and uh, then <clears throat> this is the state of art method which give you very nice compared to this one it's a lot of errors and this is very similar to this one and uh, so there's a whole of whole data set there and there are lots of application of uh, stereo um, you can generate a different view of the scenes of what you have the image here if you have a stereo get a depth map you can then take a picture from other side this is the um, view morphing you get these two images you can generate a third one and you can do virtual reality you can put objects there and um, so on so this is from Zaleski's book okay so you can look at uh, this um, material for reading and um, it's covered nicely in the my book and also Zaleski's chapter 11 so that's that's it